Thousands of cubic metres of sand have been dumped on the beach since the third day of the May school holidays. Outraged residents and disappointed tourists say the sand dredged from the bottom of Nelson Bay is an eyesore. The discoloured sand contrasts sharply with the existing beach, parts of which have been cordoned off while the work is being done. But it's the associated noise that has proved the last straw. The volume of noise is unbearable. The higher up you go in the building, the worse it gets. But it begins at a quarter past seven in the morning and it runs until about three or three thirty in the afternoon. Port Stephenshire Council says the sand had to be dumped somewhere and by putting it here, it's killed two birds with one stone, thereby tackling the serious erosion problem which threatens this strip of beachfront. The council also says it had no choice but to start work in the holiday period. The Department of Public Works is funding the project to the tune of $198,000. The department is also carrying out dredging work in Nelson Bay for a marina project and is running out of room to stockpile the dredged sand. Faced with the prospect of expensive delays if the stockpiles weren't shifted, the department asked council to start work at Shoal Bay immediately. The council says it wasn't in a position to refuse. Not really because the stockpile areas in the marina project had already filled and uh, the only alternative then for the public works would have been to pump sand into the, um, into the open channel in Nelson Bay. The plans for the project, which are on display tucked behind the souvenir spoons in the tourism office, gave residents until the 21st of March to complain. Now some residents in Shoal Bay Road did so. They say at best council was evasive and at worst their complaints were ignored. I, I wouldn't say that that's a fact. The, the, um, I've ha had no actual uh, people ring me except one person on Shoal Bay Road and I spoke to him uh, at some length prior to commencing the job. Uh, nobody else has approached me. There are letters Mr. on Mr Drew agrees, on however, that some residents may have been penalised. It probably isn't fair, but uh, Council's not in a position to knock back uh, grants from the uh, State Government, particularly of the uh, magnitude that this grant is. Tony Parks, however, remains unconvinced by the Council's claims. They bulldoze complaints just like they're bulldozing that sand. There's no doubt about that. That's the general opinion in the area. Landcom is now the largest land developer in the Hunter region. Despite high interest home loan rates, a spokesman said home builders and buyers have not been deterred. The new estate is in Turiki Street, Charlestown. 29 lots with starting prices of $25,000 will be on sale as from tomorrow. It's expected that the residential lots will be well sought after, as the estate is ideally located near local schools, transport and shopping centres. When the Lancome officials are on site tomorrow morning, they'll be greeted by families like this one, who've camped in their caravan near the sales office since Wednesday, making sure that they will be first in and first served with the pick of the lots. Tomorrow is a, a, for our a very hard game because it's the first game in the tour and uh, we must uh, win, sure. And uh, for this, uh, tomorrow we, we try in the, in the first half to make a lot of points and uh, uh, I don't know if uh, we must uh, play uh, with a scrum, with a box because uh, I, I know that... Uh, um, New South Wales country team is a very hard team, but uh, we we must uh, um, give it all the ball on the ground and on the line out. And after we play very close in the first half, I think. And after, if it's possible, we won't make a running rugby in the second half. So people can expect a fast game tomorrow. Oh, it's possible a fast game because uh, if uh, uh, Australian players is very very tough and very strong. Our players is uh, fast, not very fast, but fast. And uh, if uh, this is the way for win the match, uh, we play fast. If it's the way for win the match is another, we play another uh, another way. Sure, we and, want to win. And the test match, how are you going to be playing that? Oh, the test match, uh, 
is uh, very hard for our too, because uh, for me Australia now is uh, one of the four um, Ike team in the world, sure, and uh, with uh, the uh, very very good uh, backs that uh, Australia all the time have. Now we have a very big scrum, uh, very tough and uh, with a good jumper. Our planes for the test uh, is a planes of a, a, a little team against a great team and uh, we must uh, be very tough like uh, Australia and uh, with our bolts that I think is not too much we must uh, play whole I think and uh, we must uh, try don't uh, give the ball to David Campisi because uh, it's very difficult to take off. The Italian side is looking forward to a tough encounter against country tomorrow at the number two sports ground. The match will be the first of the Australian tour which will culminate in a test match against Australia at Ballymore in Queensland on the 1st of June. Gate takings from the day's rugby will go towards the Richard Cusick appeal. Richard, a former Hamilton rugby player, became a paraplegic in a match last season. When the Italian side heard the money was going to such a good cause, they paid for their tickets into the ground, normally free to players. Italian captain Mazio Innocenti says he expects tomorrow's match to be a strong contest. Tomorrow is a, a, for our a very hard game because it's the first game in the tour and uh, we must uh, win, sure. And uh, for this, uh, tomorrow we, we try in the, in the first half to make a lot of points and uh, uh, I don't know if uh, we must uh, play uh, with a scrum or with a backs because uh, I, I know that the uh, um, New South Wales country team is a very hard team but uh, we, we must uh, um, give all the ball on the ground and on the line out and after we play very close in the first half I think and after if it's possible we won't make a running rugby in the second half. The two-day workshop currently underway at the university is an advanced, intensive computing course. Attending are people from hospitals, business and government. During the session, each participant is allocated the use of a microcomputer under the watchful eye of lecturer Bruce Chi. I think it's very hard with the explosion in information that everybody has to cope with in industry to keep up to date with what's going on. One of the things that I think a lot of industry is finding that while they can buy the product to do what they want, it's another thing completely to train their staff in how to use those products most effectively and people are finding more and more that it's not the cost of buying the computing equipment that's the problem, it's the getting your staff to use that equipment efficiently and what we're trying to do is uh, have a situation where you don't have a computer that you've bought for $5,000 that's sitting doing nothing simply because you don't know how to use it. circumstances have changed, economic circumstances have changed, so that there are now in the community quite a lot of people who've decided that perhaps they've taken a wrong turn and should correct that. In other words, they, they want to move out of trade-type occupations into the kind of occupations that require tertiary qualifications, and they want to do so quickly. And from talking with such people, I became convinced that they would prefer and probably prosper better in a, a short, sharp intensive course than in the usual type of extended part-time course that, that we've always run. Uh, so, whereas we certainly intend to continue with the, the standard Open Foundation course, which has been extremely successful, uh, we are offering this as an option for people who want to get in there and get their matriculation qualifications quickly. Is the university simply trying to entice more students? 
it's not that at all. No, we're not, not hunting for students. Rather, we're trying to provide a, a different sort of opportunity to meet the needs of a, a different sort of people. And uh, that's our task here, to, to make the way clear for as many people as possible, of whatever kind they might be, as simply and suitable to them. The conference, which began this afternoon and continues tonight, has brought together representatives of the local credit union industry. Organised by the Association of New South Wales Credit Unions, the conference will look at last year's deregulation of the industry and how it has spurred further growth. I think when we met at this conference last year, we were looking at the competition of foreign banks and the likes coming in. And I think now we've seen foreign banks come in and uh, what it's clearly saying to us, there is a big place for credit unions in the consumer finance market. Why have credit unions done so well over the last few years? I think credit unions quite honestly have a, uh, a different basis to work from. They have developed a membership relationship with their customers rather than as a, a straight customer relationship. Yeah. And I think the fact that they have now developed a, let's say, a base that's uh, extremely large in New South Wales, um, we're now up to this year we'll have, uh, say, a million members of credit unions. And I think that in itself allows us to uh, uh, be united as a total body while being individual in individual credit unions themselves. The Housing Industry Association has 250 members in the Hunter area. An estimated 10% currently use computers. By introducing the higher tech system, the association hopes the numbers will increase. The system allows builders to do a wide range of functions, from ordering stationery to checking out the latest award rates, all through a central computer terminal in Sydney. The system keeps a record of work that's available and of subcontractors in country and metropolitan areas. It will also work out quotes and estimates. Costing and estimating, uh, certainly uh, ordering materials and uh, finding out the, the co associated costs with the building project. And how do your association members go about getting hold of a computer? They only have to contact myself here at the uh, Newcastle office or our Sydney office and we'll be glad to demonstrate one to them. And what then? How much will it cost? It would cost them $28 a month and uh, 19 cents every time they use the computer. What's the payoff for the association? What do you get out of it? Well, there is uh, considerable cost involved in running the association every year and uh, this helps to defray costs. As the exhibitors were setting up in the Singleton Civic Centre today, the organisers were predicting that more than 15,000 people will attend the event over the weekend. Last year's trade fair was the first of its kind in the Singleton area, and this year it's increased in size and the range of products. The aim is to show the people in and around the Singleton area what is available, so they don't have to go to larger centres unnecessarily. Exhibitors this year come from Tamworth and Musselbrook, right down the Hunter to Maitland. As well as the exhibits you'd expect to find at a trade fair, there are also several activities for the youngsters and helicopter joy flights. The trade fair runs tomorrow and on Sunday.
the Coe family landed in Australia in January 1980. If they had arrived before the first of that month, they could have applied for Australian citizenship under an amnesty agreement. Since then, the Coe's have sought permanent residency through the federal court. But on February the 26th, they were handed an order for deportation. A public meeting today gave full support for the family to stay in Australia. A telex has been sent to the Prime Minister and the Minister for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs, outlining the community's concern for the Coe's future. The Department of Immigration should take another look at them as individuals and assess their case not just as a number but as a, a family that have integrated extremely well. For David and Mary, deportation would mean selling their new home and family business, the local Chinese takeaway. But their main concern is for eight-year-old Elaine and two-year-old Amy. A trip back to Malaysia would mean more than just a cultural change. We worry a lot for our children, you see. They won't be able to go to any school in Malaysia, especially the English school. And she know nothing of other language except the English language. For the Coe family and for the community of Rathmines, it's now a case of wait and see. A federal court hearing on June the 6th will decide once and for all whether the Coe's can stay in Australia, bringing an end to a six and a half year wait for permanent residency. Sixteen delegates from nine Commonwealth countries have taken part in the Duke of Edinburgh's study conference. Arriving last Sunday in the Hunter region, the group has visited most of our industries. According to study leader Roger Sexton, they've discovered some interesting facts about how the Hunter region has identified and coped with industrial change over the past ten years. Over the last ten years, you've had a number of economic forces impinge on the area, and uh, we found that this fourth level of organisation has sprung up uh, to identify the, uh, the forces of change and, and cope with it. There are organisations like uh, the Hunter Valley Development Board, um, the uh, Hunter Valley Region of Councils, the uh, Hunter Valley Summit is a good example of a community group that was brought together to uh, uh, look at changes taking place. Has your research shown that that level of government has coped with industrial change? We believe that uh, they've been very effective um, in, in a number of particular areas, uh, for example in coping with the major projects that uh, have, have developed in the Hunter Valley over the last 10 years. Um, I think they've, perhaps there's another stage that uh, needs to be developed uh, and that is looking at the future and, and preparing an overall uh, business plan uh, for the Hunter Valley. Just how impressed has the study team been with the Hunter Valley and all that it has to offer? Very much so. I think the, the general feeling uh, in the Hunter Valley is very positive. Um, positive in the sense that people recognise there are still problems to be solved, um, both regionally and uh, at the national level in terms of the economy, and they're addressing those, those problems in a very uh, direct uh, and positive way. Estimated around the year 2060. To put it back again. A time After capsule putting their own pictures in news clippings and their own and electronic tape odds and ends of the year 1986 now rest the top of the The names appearing on the plaque represent 50 old time stargazers and 26 young viewers. For the Greek family, four generations have now seen the astronomical spectacle and they'll be watching and waiting for another 76 years when the time capsule will be opened marking Halley's return. James and David MacArthur, both in Year 12 at Newcastle High School, competed against 15 other schools at Gerringong on the south coast over the weekend to take out the state school surfing title. 
In awarding the shield which bears his name today, Mark Richards commented that these boys were the professional surfers of the future. They will now go on to represent New South Wales at the national school surfing titles at Kiama, and David MacArthur, who came first in four of the five rounds served at the state titles, has been selected to compete in the New South Wales All-Stars team. Both Gary and David hope to make a future career in professional surfing and next year will surf the testing pro-am circuit. Meanwhile, a new sport, corfball, was introduced to the district's physical education teachers at St Pius X High School at Adamstown. Corfball, a European game similar in many aspects to netball, was introduced to Australia six years ago. This is the first time, however, it has come to New South Wales. It's played on a court similar in size to a netball court, However, the baskets are located about one and a half metres inside the back line. The two teams consist of four girls and four boys, and the object of the game is to score more baskets than the opposing team during the two 25-minute halves. Physical education teachers at the demonstration said that the appeal of corfball was that it was played with mixed teams and could be easily set up outdoors or indoors, and so was suitable as a wet weather sport.